This morning, we are in Matthew 5. Picking back up in verse 38 in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, when we started the Sermon on the Mount, we've been going through Matthew together, but when we started the Sermon on the Mount, we looked um, at the Beatitudes and then Jesus in verse 17 kind of gives the point that he's getting across at uh, in this sermon when he says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so Jesus is pointing out that uh, he is the authority. He's speaking with authority from God's word. It even says uh, in Matthew 7, verses 28 and 29, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, that when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. And so Jesus is talking about the authority of God's standard, the law that God has set, and, and how they had lowered that standard. And Jesus is saying, you guys are missing the point. You've missed the mark. You've misunderstood God's law. And he's putting the standard back in its proper place. In verse 20 of Matthew 5, he said this, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so, again, we've said this every week, the people would have had a hard time with that because Jesus is saying that he is not doing away with the law of Moses, but that he is teaching the law of Moses. But he then says that the scribes and Pharisees aren't righteous enough. Well, that's who the people looks to to teach them the law of Moses. And so they're thinking, well, if Jesus teaches the law of Moses and so do these guys, how can Jesus say they're not making the cut? And the point he's getting across is that they had lowered the standard. They couldn't meet God's standard. And when you can't meet a standard, this happens all the time today in society, all over, when you can't meet a standard and you don't get the results you want, it's easier to just lower the standard so you can meet it. And that's what they had done. And so they had made themselves, declared themselves righteous because they were meeting the standard that they had set. And Jesus starts to give them examples of how they have fallen short. And today in verse 38, he says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to him the other also. <clears throat> and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. And give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And so, very similar to everything else we've seen so far in the Sermon on the Mount. Just like this was difficult for them to hear those things, it's difficult for us because especially as Americans and in our culture today, uh, we think very much about our rights, okay, and, and, and what my rights are. We talk more about rights probably today uh, than any other time in my lifetime, maybe even your own lifetime. And we talk about, uh, as Americans, we have constitutional rights, inalienable rights. And we talk about civil rights and women's rights and parents' rights and children's rights and all kinds of rights. And uh, what I mean by that is when someone mistreats us or does something we don't think they should do, we say, well, I know my rights. Or I have the right to do this. You can't treat me that way. Right? You, you can't talk to me like that. Uh, I know what my rights are. And, and so, hey, you did something to me that I didn't like, and so I have the right to do something back to you that you don't like. That's kind of the way we think today. That's why we love stories and movies about people who are wronged in some way, and then they track the person down and get revenge, right? They track them down and get even, or they uh, overthrow a corrupt corporation or, or whatever. That's kind of our human nature. We, we want to get even. We don't want to let people get away with anything. We want to make sure people know they can't do that to us. They can't talk to us that way. And that's because that's our heart, right? Our, our natural uh, 
human heart is vengeful. We want to retaliate. We want to get even. We want to get, get somebody back. And that's because our heart is vengeful. And that's the point we're going to see today that Jesus is making. Uh, we've said this in the last several weeks, right? That, that Jesus is talking about the condition of the heart. And when we say, what's wrong with humanity? Well, the heart of the human condition is the condition of the human heart. And so Jesus is pointing this out again in another way, that the problem is not just outside of you, it's inside of you. Matthew 15, 18 and 19, we've, we've looked at this passage uh, almost every week the last several weeks. But this is the point that Jesus is making in the Sermon on the Mount. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. And so the human heart is vengeful, and we want to get even, and we want to get somebody back, and we want people to know they can't get away with this, they can't do that to us, they can't talk to me that way. And that's the way the people of the Jewish culture at the time felt too. Jesus is addressing them, and they had misapplied some Old Testament. Right? They, they had taken the idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and had used it as a license for vengeance. Right? It was like the green light to go ahead and get even and get somebody back. So Jesus says, you have heard that it was said. And remember, we've talked about that. That's rabbinic tradition because the people didn't have access or weren't able to use the Hebrew scrolls. All right? Not everybody had a copy and things like we do. And also they lost some of their language in captivity. So the scribes and Pharisees and rabbis would read to them and tell them and teach them what it said and what it meant. And so when he says, you have heard that it was said, he's referring to what they've been taught by teachers in the past. And he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. <laughs> and that's what they had taken to, to very literally. I mean, if somebody does something to me, I can do it right back to them. I can get even or get revenge. And Jesus comes and he says, hey, if somebody hits you on the cheek, let them have the other cheek also. They want to sue you and take your coat, let them have your shirt too. They ask you to go and carry something for them one mile, carry it for them two miles. If they need something you have and you're able to let them borrow it, let them borrow it. Right? Verse 39 I say to you, don't resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. And give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And so we read those kinds of things today and we kind of flinch at that because that's not the way we think. If you slap me in the face, what is, what is our thought? Someone slaps you in the face. Your thought is, I hope you packed your lunch, buddy. Right? <laughs> Someone slaps you in the face and you're ready to you know, knock their lights out and, and just pop off and, and retaliate immediately. Jesus says, it's not the way we're supposed to be. Someone wants to sue you and take your stuff. What do, what do we do today? Oh, well, I'm, I'm going to file a countersuit. Right? I'm going to drag this thing out. It'll cost you so much in court. You'll wish you never mess with me, man. That's what we do. Jesus says they want to sue you for your coat, your tunic. Let them have your, your shirt, too. Somebody makes you do something you don't want to do. We think, I'm not doing any more. Right? I'm going to do the bare minimum. But I'm not doing any extra. Jesus says, no, go two miles with them. We don't want to let people borrow our things. Because there are things. Right? What if they don't take care of our things? That's the way we think. And, and so it's a struggle. And it's a struggle for them too. And, and, and the reason that kind of is a struggle is because, partly, that we do have a sense of justice in us. Right? We all have a sense of what justice is. Because we're made in God's image, right? Genesis 127. We're made in the image of God. And so God is just. And we're made in His image. And so we have an internal understanding of justice. But God's perfectly just and, and we're sinful. And so that idea of justice kind of gets perverted by the sin that is in us. But we also all have the moral law of God written on our heart. That's kind of part of that idea of justice 
2. It says in Romans 2.15 that God's written the law, his law in the hearts of all men, and then we have a conscience that bears witness to that. So we have knowledge of what is right and wrong, and it's called a conscience. That's what the Bible calls it. Con means with, science means knowledge, so a conscience means with knowledge. And what does the Bible say? Your conscience is that you were born with the knowledge of the moral law of God on your heart. And so we have this sense of justice, but it's become skewed because we're sinful. It's distorted. And our desire for justice really turns into a desire for vengeance. I want to get back at somebody. I want to get even. Somebody does something wrong. And, and, and the reason we want to make it right isn't because we, we want to uphold law and order and we want to make sure that God receives the honor and glory that he deserves. Now, that's not the reason when someone does something wrong that we typically want to make it right. When we say make it right, what we mean is we want to make sure they know that they can't do that to me, that they can't treat me that way. And so we fight for rights today, and my right to this and my right to that, and so much so that we'll set other things aside in the name of what my rights are. I have the right to do this. I have the right to do that. I have the right to not do whatever. And we'll set the law aside and we'll set, in our country, even the Constitution aside. But more severely, we'll set the Word of God aside. Right? We'll say, well, I know what the law says, but, but it's my right to do whatever. I know what the Constitution says, but I have the right to insert here, okay? Or worse, I know what the Bible says, but I have every right to do this or feel this or whatever. And so we don't have time to look at the whole chapter, but for some context today, I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and this idea of rights. Because that's really what Jesus is kind of talking about. It is, is when it comes to our rights, we want to get revenge. We want to make sure that no one takes anything from us, and if they do, we're going to get them back. So I want to see what Paul says about rights in 1 Corinthians 9. Uh, the first seven verses there, Paul says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you're the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take a believing wife? as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, which is Peter? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruits? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? And so in those verses, Paul says, hey, I'm a minister of the gospel, and as an apostle, a minister of the gospel, as a pastor, I have the right to earn a living as a minister. He says, I have the right to be paid for my ministry. He says, I have the right to take a Christian life if I choose to do that. He says, I have the right to do other work in order to make a living or supplement myself. He gives a lot of other examples too. He says, does a soldier have to pay his own way when he's going to battle? Does a soldier buy his own weapons and his own supplies? Does a person who's gardening not have a right to eat what he grows? Does a person that's taking care of livestock not have a right to, when they milk the cow to get milk? And so he talks about rights. He has the right to do these things. He goes on and describes other rights that he and the apostles have as ministers of the gospel. And so there's no question in Paul's mind, and he makes clear in Scripture, that he has all these rights. He can do those things if he chooses. He has the right to do it. But in verse 12, starting in the second half of verse 12, 1 Corinthians 9, he says this, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. I would rather die 
than have anyone deprive me of my grounds for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And so Paul says, I have the right to do all these things. So people may have been saying the apostles couldn't do that. And Paul says, no, I have every right to do those things if I want to do them. The reason I haven't done them isn't because I don't have the right to do them. It's because I don't want it to be a stumbling block for you in my ministry of preaching the gospel. The same idea in Romans chapters 14 and 15. We're going to look at just the first four verses of Romans 14. But it's the same idea. He says, as for the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him. Do not quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and not the one, not, not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. <clears throat> so the same idea. Paul says, listen, there are some that don't eat meat. So they think it's wrong. There are some people who know that because of their Christian liberty, they can eat those things. He says the weaker brother says he doesn't understand that. But, but that shouldn't be a division. We shouldn't let that be a stumbling block. Just because I have the right to eat these things doesn't mean I should fight with you about it to prove my point. If it's going to hinder the ministry or the sharing of the gospel, there shouldn't be that division. And so today, right, it may be other things, but he talks about the weaker brother. And, and I kind of jokingly say if they were eating more than vegetables, maybe they'd be so weak, right? But he's talking about spiritually weak, not physically. And, and so they're just not as mature. They don't understand some of the same doctrines and theologies, but you don't have to fight with them about that because it's, Paul says, it's, it's not a major issue. Right? It shouldn't be a dividing issue. Today, it may be other things. Right? right now in our society, it's masked or unmasked or vaccinated or unmasked or vaccinated. In church, it may be what Bible translation you use. It may be all these things. And Paul says, you have the right. You have the right to, to fall where you fall on those issues. But it shouldn't become a hindrance in the ministry. And, and so that's what he's talking about uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, Romans 14. Don't use those liberties that, to cause others to stumble. And as Americans, not only do we have freedom as Americans or uh, as people of the 21st century, but as Christians, we have Christian liberty. We have freedom in Christ uh, that we, we receive uh, and are shown in the scripture. We, we, can, we can push that so far. right? If we push it, we take it so far just to prove a point, just to make sure that we get our due, right? just to, to make sure that we don't lose any of our rights. Paul says, I have all these rights but I've not taken any of them. But sometimes we want to push it so far just to make sure that we get all of the things that we rightly uh, deserve or, or, or do. And we do it to the point where we don't care who it hurts and we don't care what the effects of it are. We don't care who it causes to stumble. We don't care how it affects the way a person views us and even worse, how they view the Savior we claim because I have the right. And so nothing else matters because I have the right to this. And so that's kind of the idea that Jesus is talking about with Matthew. He talks about forgiveness and grace and mercy in, in comparison to retaliation and revenge and getting even. And so he's kind of he's directly speaking against their system. Right? They, they thought they'd made themselves righteous. They thought they were following uh, the, the, the law. But the problem is they changed it. And so Jesus is ripping that away. They thought that because of their legalism and their rituals and their ceremonies and the way they interpreted the law that they were making themselves righteous. And Jesus is ripping that away from them so that they'll see who they truly are and that is unrighteous and that they're sinners. And so this Sermon on the Mount may seem kind of harsh, right? Sometimes we see the things Jesus says in the Gospels and we think, ooh, that's not very nice, Jesus. You're not being very loving, Jesus. Telling these people that they're murderers at heart, that they're adulterers at heart, and that they're liars to the core. And now you're telling them that their, their vengeful heart is wicked, 
and that's not very nice, Jesus, but, and that's not very loving. But, but the point he's, he's proving to them is that they're lost and they're sinners, and that's because he's being loving. Right? That's a very loving thing to do, because if a person doesn't realize they're a sinner, then they don't know that they need to be saved in the first place. It's true. Mm -hmm. Right? Why would anybody come to a Savior that they don't believe they need? And so he's pointing out their wickedness so that they'll know that they need to be saved. Hey. And so verses 38 through 42, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I say to you, do not resist the one who's evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone will sue you to take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And people have come to this passage and they've used it to teach all kinds of poor things, right? That we should be a pacifist and that Christians basically should be doormats in the world. And that's clearly not what he's talking about. We can see the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And we have this, I've said this phrase a few times, but a big picture biblical theology and with a little bit of discernment and this big picture Bible theology Clearly, that's not what Jesus is teaching. So let's look at what he is teaching. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's the rabbinic tradition. This one, though, is word for word from the Old Testament. So what do we do with it? It is word for word from the Old Testament. It says in Exodus 21, verses 23 through 25, But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, Burn for burn, wound for wound, and stripe for stripe. So it comes straight from the Old Testament. So why does Jesus say, you've heard this, but I say to you, and he talks about something different? Well, I want us to understand what they had done is they had taken this out of the Old Testament and misapplied it. They were applying it to situations it wasn't supposed to be applied to. Um, and so kind of like today, right, they already had their ideas they believed in getting revenge, just like us, naturally. We want to get even. And so what they did was, they say, I already believe this. Let me go see if there's any verses that seem to be worded in such a way to support what I already believe. And that's kind of what they had done. And, 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 and so I want us to understand a few things. Yes, the Bible talks about law and order. That's Jesus' opening to this section of the sermon. I'm not going to abolish the law. It will not pass away. The Bible upholds and, and teaches about law and order. Uh, God uh, created law. He exalts law. Romans 13 says that law and order in the government serves as an agent for God that's ordained by God. And so when we see things about forgiveness and mercy and grace, like Jesus is talking about here, extending to other people, that's not in any way diminishing or downgrading what the Bible teaches about or contradicting what the Bible teaches about law and order. Uh, we saw that in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. If you remember when we went through that together, that's been a long time. But Paul says that we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. That's what they, they were using it unlawfully. That's what Paul talks to them about in Ephesus with Timothy. That's what Jesus is explaining to them in the Sermon on the Mount. They were using the law unlawfully. Verse 9 of 1 Timothy 1. Understanding this, that the law is not laying down for those uh, for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, unholy, profane, for those who strike fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. In accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And so the law is good when it's used lawfully. That's what Paul says in 1 Timothy. That's what Jesus wants them to understand in the Sermon on the Mount. But they've been using it unlawfully. And that's what we would all do, right? If we're just left to our own devices, if we just get to come up with our own rules and our own standard, if we're just left to our own devices, then typically, most of the time, the things that I want, if I'm honest, are unlawful according to God's standards of righteousness. The things that my flesh wants are not righteous things. And so when left to our own devices, we're going to use the law unlawfully. And so, verse 38, Matthew 5. An eye for an eye, you heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That does come from Exodus 21. Now, why are they using it unlawfully? 
Well, we need some context, right? We talked about Matthew 5, or we started talking about this uh, a few weeks back. If you remember, I talked about there's three kinds of laws in the Old Testament, right? There was a moral law that's the same for everybody all the time. Don't kill, don't steal, moral law. There's ceremonial law, which was a lot of the worship and temple stuff. And then there's civil law, which is about interactions in a society, particularly like a court system or a legal system or a government. And so, and those are distinctively different. The way that, that my relationship with, with any of you, with Kevin, or even the relationship with my wife and my children, is not the same as my relationship with the government. And it shouldn't be. Yeah. Right? But what they had done, uh, they'd taken an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was a part of the civil law. Right. In Exodus 21, we start to get civil law. That same phrase shows up two more times in Leviticus 24 and Deuteronomy 19. And every single time it comes up, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth in the Old Testament, it is not about personal relationships or being wronged by another individual. It is about a government, legal, court-type system. And the idea there of a law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, was not so they could take it and make it about personal vengeance, right? Kevin punched me so I can punch him back, and that's what the Old Testament says. The idea was that the judicial system, the court system, the legal system should be fair. That the punishment should match the crime. And we see that in the Old Testament, right? The punishment for stealing something was not the same as the punishment for murdering someone. And we would agree with that. The punishment should meet the crime. A lot of times, the things we're upset with today in our own judicial and legal system is that the punishment doesn't meet the crime. Either the crime is very severe and the punishment is not, or the crime's kind of a silly crime and the punishment's way too severe for what the crime is. And so that's the idea. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, burn for burn. It was this principle that it should be this fair and unbiased judgment of you've done this and the fair penalty for that is this. But they had taken that principle and taken it very literally and applied it to their interactions with one another. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. They used it as a green light for revenge and for vengeance. And Jesus is pointing out that's not the way it's supposed to be. And then all the examples he gives are about interactions with other individuals. Because he's making this distinction that it's different. I don't want the government, and I hope you don't, we don't want the government to, to be like we want our relationships with friends and family. When somebody does something that's criminally wrong, we don't want the government to say, well, listen, you know what you did was wrong. And uh, we're just going to forgive you. Let's forget it ever happened. Right? Water under the bridge. We know you murdered a bunch of people, but you know it's wrong, and you promised to never do it again. So we'll just let it go, right? We'll forgive you 70 times 7. And even if you do do it again, we'll forgive you again. But just promise us you won't do it again, okay? That's not the way we want the government to act. Amen. But we also don't want our relationships with individuals to function like government. And if I do something to upset Adrian, I don't want her to come to the house and say, you've upset me, and so you need to pay a $50 fine, or this is going to stay on your permanent record. <laughs> right? We don't want that in our interpersonal relationships with people. Or if she wants to come talk to me or, or a friend have a conversation, I don't want to say, okay, well, we can't talk about that right now. We're going to have to wait till the next legislative session. <laughs> and at that time, you can propose something. We'll discuss your proposal. We'll vote about it as a house. Right? Me, Kinsley, and Addie will vote to decide if we're going to even uh, entertain your proposal. And if we vote to entertain it at that legislative session, then we'll discuss it with you at the next one. Right? We don't want our relationships with other individuals to function like government. And we don't want the government to function like we expect and want our relationships with individuals to function. When I wrong a friend or they wrong me, we want forgiveness and mercy and love. It's a different, it's a personal relationship. When someone's a criminal committing a, a bunch of criminal uh, crimes and, and actions, we don't want to just say, go ahead, 
and we'll just keep forgiving you. Just go do all these terrible things. There's a distinction in those relationships. And so Jesus wants them to understand that. They've taken an eye for an eye that was meant for this government judicial setting and tried to apply it to this very personal relationship setting. We don't want that. If I borrow Kevin's weed eater or something and it breaks under my watch, I don't want him to come to my house and say, well, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You had my weed eater, it broke. It's about a $150 weed eater. So uh, what have you got that's worth 150 bucks that I can break so we're even and we can get this over? Right? That's not how it's supposed to function. And Jesus is pointing out that distinction. And so he says, I say to you, don't resist the evil, uh, the one who's evil. Someone slaps you, turn on your other cheek. They sue you to take your tunic, give them your cloak as well. If they force you to go a mile, go two miles. Uh, if they beg from you, and don't refuse them. If they want to borrow something, let them borrow it. So the first thing I want to point out quickly, he says don't resist the one who's evil. Again, he's not saying we should ever stand against evil and sin. Clearly we should. This is about reacting or retaliating when someone wrongs you. Right? Your initial response as a believer, certainly, God's standard is not that we just punch back real fast. Right? That's, that's the point. It's not talking about just be abused and walked all over, but he is saying that we should, in our heart, it should not be you've wronged me, I've wronged you, or even. That should not be our initial reaction. We've talked a little bit about uh, how we handle sin and evil in a church setting when we discuss church discipline on Wednesday nights. Uh, we've seen all through 1 Timothy when we studied through that several different ways to stand against injustice and evil and sinfulness. But in our interpersonal relationships, we don't just bite back real fast, just retaliate. That's uh, the, the point there. Don't resist. Don't just jump right back. Don't just fight. It takes two people to fight. You can't fight by yourself. Right? So don't don't just jump right back and retaliate. And so he's pointing out that distinction that it should be different when we're dealing with one another. And the problem today, I'll admittedly in our society, probably clearly in theirs too, but we've kind of blurred that distinction or erased it altogether. And, and so we kind of forget what the individual roles and rights are, and we kind of forget what the role of government is. But Jesus is saying God has established government with these roles and for these purposes, and they need to stay in their lane. And he's designed us to fulfill interpersonally with each other these roles and these purposes, and we're to stay in our lane. We don't cross back and forth. And that's what he's pointing out. We shouldn't blur the lines. We shouldn't, even if everybody else is, we should understand that distinction. And so he gives a couple of illustrations. He talks about getting slapped. He talks about getting sued. He talks about being forced to go one mile. And he talks about someone that's begging or needing something from you. And those are about your dignity, your security, your liberty, and your property, right? The first one is about your dignity, and you do have the right, as a human being, to be treated with dignity, because you're made in the image of God. Amen. You're intrinsically valuable because you're made in the image of God. Amen. You have the right to be treated with dignity. But we know that's not always the way we're treated. Sometimes we're treated like we're less than human, we're treated like we're less important, we're treated like we have no value, and one of the probably most demeaning things a person can do to you is slap you. Right? If somebody slaps me or backhands me, that's very demeaning. If you punch me, at least you kind of treat me like we're equals, right? But if you slap me, that's demeaning. That's not treating me with dignity. And so Jesus says, if somebody slaps you, let them slap you again. Turn to them the other also. And that is against everything in our being, right? Someone slaps you or demeans you, our initial reaction is you're not going to treat me with dignity, that's fine. Two people can play that game. And that's the point, right? Is it takes two people to fight. And so we shouldn't be reacting in that way or retaliating. Someone slaps you, turn the other cheek. Well, why does he use that example? I think... Personally, this is just my opinion, but I think it's because the point is not to just stand there and be beat to a pulp. You only got two cheeks. 
Right? After two cheeks, you're out. So you can speak up and you can, you know, you shouldn't just sit there and be beat on or be demeaned over and over. But the idea is that's not, that should not be our first thing is to pop back. Or to offer forgiveness and grace and mercy. You've wronged me, I forgive you. So much so that I'll give you the opportunity to wrong me again. Right? You've mistreated me, you've humiliated me in a sinful way. But I'll give you the opportunity to do that again. Because I'm forgiving. Right? Turning the other cheek is to offer grace and mercy and forgiveness. Jesus literally was slapped in John chapter 18. We'll look at that quickly. John 18, 19 through 23. He's literally slapped. And what does he do? The high priest, verse 19, John 18. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I've spoken openly to the world. I've, also, I've always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Verse 22. When he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? He slapped Jesus. You can't talk to the high priest that way. And what's Jesus do? He speaks up. Speaking up does not mean he's not turning the other cheek, right? Jesus, verse 23, Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why did you strike me? And so turning the other cheek isn't being a doormat. Jesus spoke up. He was slapped. He's demeaned. He's mistreated. But he says, if what I did was wrong, explain to me why it was wrong. If it's not wrong what I said, why did you slap me? And he turned his cheek plenty of times, right? They pulled his beard out. They spit in his face. They shoved the crown of thorns into his scalp. They mocked him. They beat him. He speaks up. He asks them hard questions. He offers rebuttals. He rebukes them. Uh, he, he asks Pilate some hard questions. Uh, he does all of that. But that doesn't mean he didn't turn the other cheek. How do I know? Because he could have stopped all of it at any point, right? The first time they ripped his beard out, he could have killed every one of them just by thinking it. When they were beating him, he could have put an end to it just by thinking it. So asking questions, speaking up, holding people accountable, that does not mean you're not turning the other cheek. Jesus turns the other cheek. Uh, how do I know? Because on the cross, what's he say? He says, Father, forgive them. He asked questions. He spoke up, but he was forgiving. He didn't try to retaliate and get even. The next thing, verse 40, if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. People are going to take advantage of us. They're going to want to take things from us. And our initial reaction, especially if they're suing us, is countersuit, get them back, make them regret ever taking. I'm going to make sure it costs them more in court than they're ever going to be able to get from me. And Jesus says, they try to sue you to take your tunic, let them have your cloak as well. Offer more than they've asked for. And the idea again, don't, this isn't saying we should just let people take everything we have. If that were what the Bible taught, and that's what Christians believe, people would sue us all the time. And we just have to take it. The idea is that you've wronged a person. You've actually done something to wrong this person. They have the right to sue you. And instead of trying to weasel out of it, or cheat, or lie, or countersue, realize you've wronged this person. They have the right to take you to court, which there's a place for that, right? There's distinctions. And there's places and time for the court has to decide the outcome of the thing. But the idea is that you've wronged this person. And rather than weasel out of it or try to countersue or, or try to lie about it, Jesus says, why don't you just maybe be sorry that you wronged them? Why don't you let them know that you're sorry? Right? Heartbroken over sin, the Beatitudes. And what's he say in Matthew 5, uh, 22 through 26, 21 through 26? He talks about the heart. He says, if you have anger in your heart towards someone, but he also says, if you know that your brother has something against you, go make it right as soon as you can. And so Jesus says, when you've wronged somebody, rather than letting you go to court, why don't you try to make it right? 
when you've legitimately wronged them, let them know you're sorry. Ask for forgiveness. And the reality is when you do that, people don't know how to respond. You say, listen, I know I did wrong. I'm sorry. You know, here's what you're asking for. And here's even more than you're asking for. I want to make this right, whatever it takes. And most of the time when that happens, what do they do? Oh, never, you know, don't even worry about it. Never mind, right? But it's about being genuinely sorry and trying to make it right when you wrong somebody. So he says if they want to take your, basically if they want to take your shirt, let them have your undershirt as well. And they would have probably stood up and said, well, like, the Jews would have said, wait, we have the right to that undershirt. Exodus 22 says that you can take everything a man has in court, but you can't take his tunic, his undershirt. That's the basis of our security. You can't leave me stark naked, right? You can take everything else, but you have to let me have, I have the right to that shirt. And Jesus says, if he tries to take all your other stuff, let him know that you want to make it right, even if you have to give him the last piece of security you have, and that's your undershirt. <coughs> it's about your heart and the way you deal with confrontation and making things right. Kind of an echo of earlier, Matthew 5, 21 through 26. But we should want to make things right when we wrong somebody. The next thing, verse 41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. We have the right to be free. We should respect each other's freedom and Christian liberty. But there are going to be people who don't, right? Not just as Americans, but Christian liberty. There are going to be people who don't. There are going to be other believers. And Paul talks about in Romans, they're the weaker brother that don't understand the Christian liberty the same way we do, or the same way you do. And they're going to try to infringe on those liberties and make you do things you don't want to do. And so it happens all the time, whether that's time freedom or financial freedom or, or actual other rights. There are, things I, there are times I want to spend time with my wife and my family. There are times I want to do other things. There's things I wish I could put more money towards, financially be more free. There's all, and then something happens and, and something comes up and, and the phone rings or you got to go over here or you got to go do that or this person needs me right now. And you start to think, man, I'm giving my whole life away, all my time, all of my, all my freedom is being taken by all these other things and all these other people. And I have the right to say no or to not do that or to not do this. Jesus says, if somebody forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. And so the idea there, just so you understand, is the Roman officials, Roman soldiers, could be carrying their stuff and they're tired and they come across somebody, come across a Jew on the road, and they could have said, here, you have to carry my stuff now. And you have to, for at least one mile. They couldn't, they legally could not make you carry more than a mile, but they could make you carry stuff for one mile. And so he says, if someone forces you to go one mile, go two. They can't make you go two. But if they force you to go one mile, go two miles. Think of uh, when Jesus is carrying the cross and he physically can't, and the Roman soldier gets uh, Simon the Cyrene to finish carrying it. They could do that. They, the Roman officials could make other people carry stuff for them up to one mile. And so Jesus says, they ask you to go one mile, go two miles. Well, that's what if it's really inconvenient? What if it's not even the direction I'm heading? I just came from that way. I'm having to backtrack a mile. I'm definitely not gonna, I'm not gonna backtrack two miles. Jesus says they force you to go a mile, go with them two miles. That's hard to do, right? It's, it's inconvenient, it's, it's, especially if you're a Jewish person and this Roman soldier is literally asking you to carry the things that he uses to oppress you and your people. The literal weapons of warfare against you and he tells you to carry it and you have to legally Jesus says go ahead and carry it two miles that's a difficult thing to do it's kind of like in first Timothy right when Paul told them pray for all rulers and kings not just the people you like even the people you don't like even if that remember Ephesus Roman Empire pray for all rulers even if that ruler is Nero, right? It's hard to pray for people that don't treat you well. It's hard to do extra for people that are mistreating you. But Jesus says, when they ask you to go a mile, force you to go a mile, go two miles. 
We'll see the same idea next week in 44 and 45. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But he says, go two miles. Lastly, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And so that's another problem we have, and they were the same way. When I have something and it's mine, it's mine, right? We're kind of all like little kids in that way. Don't want to share, it's mine. I just got that paid for, I just got that paid off. I, I just did this, I, like I worked and I saved for this, I put a lot of time into this, and this is mine. I don't want to share it. And then somebody comes up and says something like, and this is just what I came up with, because I know this is uh, probably true of me. Kinsley told me this morning, she said something about, I told her not to play with something in, in here because it would make a mess. And she said, I'll just do it in the truck because it's messy anyway. <laughs> and I was like, thanks, dear. Yeah. You're half the reason it's messy, right? Yeah. Only half that mess is my mess. <laughs> but somebody comes along and they need to borrow a vehicle. I, hey, I need a car. Can I borrow your car? And if it's me you need to borrow your car, you've probably gone home and talked to your spouse. And the conversation goes like this. Hey, Brother Tyler wants to borrow the car. And your spouse says, well, we just cleaned the car. Right? <laughs> We just cleaned the car. And his kids are pretty good at church, but I'm pretty sure they're probably hellions when they're not here. And have you seen the wheels on the car? I think he hits every curve. He's just, I mean, every, he's torn up the wheels. We can't let him borrow the car. He won't take care of it. It'll make a mess. His, his kids will leave french fries in the back seat under the car seat. But Jesus says, someone needs something, let them have it or let them borrow it. And again, it's the idea of a genuine need. This isn't about willingly and knowingly just enabling people that, that are, are involved in things they shouldn't be. But when there's a genuine need that we're to ask, or if someone asks for help, we're to help Amen. and to offer that. And Jesus is pointing out to these people that uh, the same way that we hear those sayings and we kind of flinch, he's pointing out to the scribes and Pharisees. This is the kind of heart you ought to have when people ask and do these things to you. And the fact that that's not your initial reaction proves that you're not as righteous as you think you are. Your man-made system has fallen short of God's standard. We should be generous and offer to help others when they really truly need something and we can help them. It says, verse 42, give to the one who begs from you, do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. This isn't about just Helping out here and there so you can pat yourself on the back and feel better. Right? This is about someone who literally, really, genuinely needs something and you're able to help. And so Jesus is pointing to the sinfulness of the human heart because we like an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? I know I do in my heart. We like that. You do something wrong to me, I want to get you back. I remember in high school, I had my car, my friend had a car, and he did something silly. We took a pizza to go from Pizza Pro or something, and he packed the box up, and the pizza cutter was still in there. And so we were 16 and dumb, and for some reason, I guess he thought the police were going to like chase us down for the larceny of a pizza cutter. Right? And he panicked and threw it out the car window. And when he did, I didn't see all that. I heard this later. But when he did, I heard on my car. And so there was a huge dent. When we got home, I was like, what's this? And my other buddy was like, he threw a pizza cutter out the window. And being 16-year-old boys, he was like, man, I'm sorry. I dented your car. You can dent my car. And at 16, I thought, seems fair. So I went over to his car and I went, and put a dent in it, right? But that's the way we think. We naturally want an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus points out that that is misapplying that principle. We take those things from Scripture. We take other things from Scripture to just vindicate and justify what we already believe. That's what they had done. Well, the Scripture says this. And Jesus says, no, that's, that's not the way it works. You're, you're, you're misusing those things to hide the fact that you're unrighteous and that you're sinful. But as we close, think about it. 
we hear these statements. Anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn them the other also. First time we hear that, our initial thought is to say, uh, I don't think so, man. If you slap me, I'm fixing to let my redneck out a little bit, right? That's our first thought. Anyone would sue you and take your tunic and let them have your cloak. I don't think so, man. I'm going to make you regret ever doing this to me. That's the way we think. Verse 41, someone forces you to go a mile, go two miles. We hear that and we say, uh, I'm not doing any extra for you. You make me go a mile, especially if I'm a Jew and you're a Roman and you're oppressing me and you're going to make me carry this a mile. I'm going to stop. Like if I have to tiptoe to make sure I don't go over a mile, I'm not going over a mile. And then I'm probably going to drop your stuff hard enough, hoping that it falls and you got to pick it all up. And Jesus says, no, that's not what we're supposed to do. Right? Verse 42, give to those who beg, don't refuse the one who wants to borrow. We say, I don't think so. I know you really need help, but I'm not going to help you because you're going to tear my stuff up. You're not going to take care of it. You're going to bring it back on E, right? I don't know what it is. Apparently, I would never say this about my wife. But apparently, people talk about when their wife borrows the car, they, they know she's borrowed it because they have to always put gas in it, right? And we think that way. I'm not letting other people borrow my stuff. They won't take care of it. They'll bring it back on E. They're not going to... And, and Jesus points out that uh, that's evidence that your heart is unrighteous and sinful. He's not getting rid of justice. Justice has its proper place. But justice's proper place is not our own hands. What we're to be is loving and forgiving and gracious and merciful, especially to other believers, but to everybody. Because the world, when we act different, they can see that. They know that. And so Jesus is pointing clearly uh, and primarily to the natural, sinful, unrighteous condition of the human heart. And so the idea through the Sermon on the Mount that we continue to see, Jesus is saying, listen, it's not just about changing your mind. Jesus says you don't just need to change your actions. Jesus is pointing out that you need to have a change of heart. Because repentance is not just changing your mind, and it's not just changing your actions. A genuine repentance is to have a change of heart. And so as we prepare to have a moment of invitation, There's a lot of different things we could do and look at in those passages today, and I wanted to give you kind of an overview so you understand those examples he uses. But the point at the heart of each of those examples is that that is not our natural setting. That's not our natural response. And the reason for that is because we're sinners. That's not my natural response. My natural response is, is to be vengeful, to be spiteful, to act in a sinful way because it's not right that you can treat me this way or I have the right to this or you don't get to talk to me that way. And Jesus is using that to point out the condition of your heart. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I'm so thankful that I haven't received justice. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very thankful God has not uh, given me justice but has offered grace and mercy and forgiveness because justice would mean he could strike me dead right here, right now and send me to hell and be totally just in doing so because that's exactly what I deserve. But he hasn't, he hasn't done that because he's offered mercy and grace and forgiveness. And, and so this morning, as, if you're here, I want you to understand that in your heart, that's, that's where you're at. You're, in your heart, you're a sinner. Sin isn't the things you do on the outside. You are a sinner. You're not a sinner because you commit sins. You commit sins because in your heart you're a sinner. And that's what Jesus is pointing out. And what sinners deserve is the wrath of God and separation from God for all eternity because we've committed a capital crime against His holiness and His righteousness. But He's offered His grace and mercy and forgiveness through the person of His Son. And so this morning, if you think, you know what? I don't, I don't know that I've ever experienced that. I don't think I've ever received that. Oh, I've never truly placed my faith in Christ alone for salvation. Let's talk about that before you leave. But also, you're a believer, and you're in here, and you say, you know what? My heart's still not like it should be all the time. And I would say to you, yeah, you're right. Mine's not either. This is a process of sanctification. We're 
God's still working on me, and he's still working on you, and there's a way through which he does that. Through growing closer to, to him and following him more closely. So we're fixing to have a moment of meditation. If you want to talk about salvation, come forward. If you need to talk about baptism, if you want to join uh, Fair Play uh, as a membership, we can talk about that. If you live somewhere kind of far and you're just looking for a church that you're not having to drive so far, I'd be more than happy to point you in a direction over there because I want you to be a part, a uh, faithful, committed member of a church where you can serve and give God honor and glory, Amen. even if it's not here. Amen. But whatever it is, let's talk about it this morning where you can pray in your seat where you're at. Let's pray. Dear God, we want to come before you. Thank you for who you are and all you've done for us. Lord, we're so thankful for uh, your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness, the love that you offered us, God, uh, that, that even though we are sinners, that you died for us anyway, that you have offered to save us in spite of ourselves. Lord, that you've offered mercy and grace where we deserve punishment and justice. And God, I pray that you would help us to have that heart in, our, in us, the, the, the heart and mind of Christ, Lord, that rather than want to get even and get revenge and, and take justice into our own hands, Lord, that we would, like Christ, be able to offer forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Lord, that we would be willing to give generously to those in need, that we would be able to, to have a heart and mind that doesn't seek to retaliate, but seeks to bring you honor and glory. We pray that you would mold us more and more to the image of your Son, that we'd be better today than yesterday, and better tomorrow even than today. We pray these things in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen.